And somebody else is That's talking. why. Hello, everybody. We are here. We're just getting everyone on. Uh, we're still waiting for Don Beck to find his way on to the virtual universe here. Um, and uh, But right now we have Barbara Marks Hubbard, uh, we have Elza Malouf, we have Greg Braden, Stephen Dynan, and myself, Pedram Shojai. Uh, these are um, members of the Evolutionary Leaders Group. Uh, we meet uh, at least once a year. We try to meet uh, uh, you know, by email all the time and talk about subjects that are important to global transformation from an evolutionary perspective. And um, there's a lot going on in the world right now, and it's not just Paris, it's in Beirut, it's in Africa, it's in Kenya, there's a, there's a lot going on, and so um, I want to thank everyone for joining. This is kind of the, the, the first of hopefully, uh, you know, uh, several of these where we can get thought leaders uh, involved to talk about what's going on here. So, and then, and then Barbara, I'm going to have you mute right now, um, because we can hear you guys. Okay. Yep. Got it. Okay, cool. So, um, we're we're all from different parts of the world. We're all from different uh, perspectives, and what we're doing is uh, we're let's try to open up the dialogue a little bit and talk about these tragedies and talk about them in a way that's more that's a little bit more constructive than um, let's go get those guys right. Uh, there are, there are ailments happening on this planet that we can um, you know discuss and heal on a much more humanistic level. And so let's let's just start the dialogue. I'm going to start with Greg. Uh, he's he's um, uh, done a lot of work in this area, as is everyone. I'd like everyone to kind of just introduce themselves and kind of wh where their kind of perspective comes from, and let's go. We have an hour, so we're just going to kind of punch around and really get into the, the nitty-gritty. But Greg, uh, if you don't mind, just get, go ahead and introduce yourself, and then um, let's just kind of talk about your perspective on this quickly, and then we'll go from there. Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Greg Braden. Some of you um, know me, and I know some, some do not. I, um, first, I, I want to thank you, Pedram, for making this possible today, putting this together, and I'm honored to be with my esteemed colleagues here today, uh, having what I feel is a, a very necessary conversation. My, uh, my perspective may be a little unique in terms of our evolutionary leadership group, um, because I had the opportunity to work during the Cold War years uh, behind the scenes as a senior liaison um, during the, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm hearing a sound that's distracting me here. <laughs> As a senior liaison between the U.S. Space Command and uh, uh, some Department of Defense initiatives, and it gave me unique insights into the way people think in times of conflict and, and war. And as odd as it might sound, there are actually a lot of parallels between what we see happening in the world right now, and especially with uh, what we're seeing in the Middle East and the Cold War years. And to complement that, I've also spent a lot of uh, time, 15 years, uh, over 15 years, uh, leading groups uh, in expeditions and uh, scholarly research in Egypt and especially in the Sinai with the Bedouin and uh, the indigenous people of the area also helped me to have insights into their thinking and their understanding. So uh, I'm going to bring those ideas and what I've learned from those experiences to bear uh, as well as the realities of our uh, our, our spiritual traditions uh, that we all are very familiar with to bear on, on our conversation today. So, so I hope that made sense, Pedro. Fantastic. Yeah, how about we just do a quick uh, round of intros here, um, and then that way we can just jump in. Everyone knows who's here. We're waiting for Don, but um, uh, the the technology gods have have uh, blocked him out so far. So um, uh, we'll just we'll move to Elza because Elza actually has a very unique background, being an Arab American uh, woman, um, and she uh, brings uh, a lot of kind of homegrown insight to this. So Elza. Please introduce yourself and, and say hello to, to our uh, guests here as well. Actually, I'm a Lebanese American. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, um, my uh, thank you, uh, Pedram, for for putting this all together. Um, um, I think Hezbollah is the main uh, uh, problem for Lebanon. Uh, he's holding uh, Hezbollah is holding L Lebanese hostages. Um, uh, we d d did you know that we don't have a presidential candidate at this point? Nope. So um, my background, um, um, I, I was born in Zahli, a small town uh, in the Beka Valley, uh, and um, uh, moved to Beirut 
um, in uh, in eighty two, and um, I came to America uh, to to the U S in um, nineteen eighty eight. That's my background. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll go to Barbara and then go to Stephen. Uh, Barbara, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself if you aren't already. Okay, and, uh, yeah. now am I unmuted? Yeah, you are. You okay. are. Okay, all right. Well, uh, you know, I'm uh, the eldest person. You see, never mind about the youngest one. <laughs> I believe I'm older than Irvin Laszlo, you see. So that's a tremendous step forward here. And that I would say my background in this is as an evolutionary futurist uh, realizing that the planet is in an evolutionary crisis and even though there's a lot to be dealt with on the immediate level unless we have a sense of the emergent future potential I think it will be very hard to resolve these immediate crises so my contribution would be how to make a, a participatory expression of creativity innovation love that already exists everywhere that's healing and loving and isn't known it's not the news and I'd like to help make it the news to help this crisis and every crisis for that matter fantastic welcome and thank you for being here uh, Steven, Steven Dynan yeah. So my name is Stephen Dine. I'm the founder and CEO of the Shift Network, and we produce the Summer of Peace every year. And through this, we've created a World Peace Library with probably one of the largest online resources of literally hundreds of peace builders around the world. Last week, we were just in D.C. and lobbying our Congress people around the Atrocities Prevention Board and getting up to speed on a lot of things right when we heard about what happened in, in Paris. And so. It was really, um, you know, we were very active in the whole Iran deal in the last year and um, sending that out to our members, getting invo involved at grassroots. And, and so I don't have a deep expertise in the Middle East, but I do have a, a really strong sense that if we, we need to deal with this in a very evolutionary way that is that's based in love but also is savvy about what needs to be protected and, and right use of military. And so I think it's an opportunity for all of us to really evolve our thinking how to like how everybody has a piece of the larger solution and not just simply to be reacting from kind of the, our primitive brain centers and emotional reactivity which often creates more of the spiral and, and ex exaggeration of things going forward. Great, great. Um, I, you know, I just did an interview with a, a former Green Beret who was out there kind of dealing with the Hearts and Minds campaign and realizing that after 10 years in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, they were just running off of anger and they realized that you know every time they went and killed a militant his cousins and his family and yeah. the tribal relationships around there ignited more people being driven to the to to the margins and to the militants right and so their uh, assessment of the situation was go in and heal the actual communities and help the tribal elders ask them what they want don't build them a school if what they need is you know an irrigation ditch and, and really work to understand and listen to the voices of the people where these um, these terrorist groups are actually able to go recruit and, and bring people into a narrative that, that you know, is um, going after innocent people. So um, I'll open that up to whoever wants to talk about uh, the, the origins of this and what we can do. And, and I don't think any of us are interested in a blame game here. I know there's a lot of people saying, well, you know, uh, it's it's because of this. I think the 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 impetus for us here is to work on a collective sol uh, solution and a resolution that's humanistic. Um, and so, what is it in your perspective that we can do on a humanistic level to go in and heal this in a way that doesn't continue to marginalize more people? How do we? You know, what's the non-military solution to this problem? Mm -hmm. Could I just add a thing here just to consider, I, I don't know if you all read the article that John Steiner sent on what is ISIS, what does ISIS want? Mm. Yeah. Have, you, have you all seen that? Yes. yes. What we're dealing with here at that level, now that's not true of most of the, the problem, but it's, it's an apocalyptic power. Mm. And it has occurred to me that part of what is happening to the democratic nations is that the that we don't have a, a com even comparable passion toward where we are going. Dealing with an apocalyptic power, which is 
I think challenging us, I just want to add the dimension of the passion and the creativity and the purpose of this cultural response to attract. Because the amazing thing is the degree to which they're attracting. And that's because there's something really left out of the social picture yeah. that perhaps people who are evolutionaries have some response to make. That we should be adding that to our dialogue. Great. Uh, uh, you know, Barbara, we dismantled the Iraqi army, so the generals joined ISIL, uh, or what we call Daesh in Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, these are uh, they needed to put food on the table uh, for for their for their kids and mm -hmm. wife. So they they transformed into Daesh or ISIL. Uh, and uh, they, they're leading with with a false blue, uh, false order driven. Uh, uh, these these groups of ISIL. Mm -hmm. I think what's really clear um, from my perspective is that you know the U.S. military is basically designed to deliver lethal force, and that does is required in certain circumstances. But that but that destructive capacity isn't matched by the constructive co capacity. And so when we're coming in time after time and applying destructive force, then we basically just keep causing regression of the society, the, the foundations of a society further. And that's both literally physically physical infrastructure but it also goes to the level of psych psychological so there's a regression developmentally when people are bombed repeatedly i was reading about someone in yemen who is a champion of america and then his village was uh, burnt, bombed by uh, people who were trying to take out some of the leadership of al qaeda in yemen there and and just the 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 re repercussions for all the people who weren't affiliated and were sort of, sort of more or less pro pro-American, like they, there was a strong swing the other way. So we basically, by, by this application of a lot of deadly force in a, in, just, in, a, in a broad way, we end up having a huge impact of causing more and more regression of the society and, and you know, leading to worse and worse actors. And so I, I'm not, I don't believe that, that, that the military it doesn't have a role in this, but the way in which we've gone about this has continued to lead to regression rather than progression or evolution of the cultures. Um, and and then when when you add on to that that there's a whole sk sale schism that starts to happen and we start to polarize, uh, particularly against um, just Islam as a whole, and that that ends up creating this rupture of the human family that then that then feeds more and more cycles. And so I th I think that we have to be very strategic about the, about what application of military force, and then have at least as strong, if not stronger, the constructive impulse to build the societies, to build the friendships. Uh, we, I just parked a domain, peacefriendship.com. What if we each took it on upon ourselves to create one peace friendship across across the divide um, that that already exists in the world? And and I think that's how we start to to rebuild the 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 broken bonds of trust and to, to help to rebuild these societies. Actually, Stephen, it's a um, it's a uh, power trip between the Wahhabis in uh, in Saudi Arabia and between Iran. So the mullahs in Iran, Khamenei, uh, 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 is the, the head of the mullahs. And uh, the Wahhabis are ruling uh, the, uh, uh, over the, the, the Saudi family. So uh, it's, a, it's a power play between who is red, uh, who is a feudal lord, and who uh, who can be a feudal lord? There's a Shia crescent that uh, goes from the Houthis to uh, to uh, the Bahrainis uh, to uh, uh, Iran, Assad, and uh, um, and Hezbollah, and now they have uh, they have uh, Hamas as well. I'm going to jump in here. The uh, go back to what Barbara said, and a little bit with what what Stephen said as well. I, I'm trained as a scientist uh, and also a problem solver, and I did that in the corporations for 30 years. And I'm, I'm, my tendency is to look at the big picture, mm -hmm. to understand what hap what's happening, and, and then to look at specific incidents within that big picture. And what we're talking about now, these are symptoms of something much greater. We are living uh, what the experts are calling a time of extremes, where three converging cycles 
are colliding in our lifetime, and they are cycles of climate, economy, and conflict. And we're not used to thinking about those things, and we are late coming on board, recognizing that this collision of cycles is occurring. So what we're seeing is, is a response to this in, in, from different perspectives. Um, when we talk about the military, Pedro, my sense is, uh, when I, I look at what's happening right now, I think we, we are so late acknowledging the reality that we are facing that we now must use a, a military response for containment mm -hmm. so that what is happening does not spread any further. But Stephen and I had this uh, discussion a little bit. Our military can do much more than fight. They are some of the best trained, highest qualified uh, for rapid deployment and strategic deployment of things like food and medicine and hospitals and housing. Uh, and when we allow this containment to happen, uh, I think for us to go in and really begin to show that the military is much more than a fighting machine and begin to help our global family uh, in ways that we have not seen in recent years. And, and I have friends uh, in the military and now their children in the military, they want to do more than fight. They would love to be given the mission to go in and take their expertise and help. And once we begin doing those things, once the containment makes it safe for us to go in and begin and help this way, this is where the first question you asked, I think, really becomes relevant. Then we can begin building future possibilities that make uh, our the, the things that we are offering much more appealing than the things that are being offered by, uh, by militant extremism. And I think that's key with the young people. Right now, we have an entire generation that we're going to be dealing with. Unless we can show them something more appealing, uh, and, and we have good models to do this. We've done this in the past, and we can talk about that later. But I see those three, three things, the containment, human survival, meeting those needs immediately, and then creating a stronger future, a brighter future for the young people that is much more attractive than what they're being shown right now. There's been a, a lot of talk um, lately about a global Marshall Plan, and for our listeners who don't know, the Marshall Plan was something that was put forth after World War II where we realized uh, World War I didn't go well. Uh, the people who won uh, basically left the losers in destitute, abject poverty, uh, which then led to the rise of fascists and, and Nazis and all the kinds of things that, that got us into another mess. And so uh, we made it a point to rebuild Western Europe, rebuild the, the, the countries that we firebombed. Uh, and to a certain extent, that was a successful program because it brought relative stability and prosperity. Um, so I'd love to discuss this kind of income inequality and some of the abject poverty that also drives people to be marginalized. I mean, you gotta you gotta have a lot that you are willing to lose to be a suicide bomber, whether it's through a narrative or through you know life having your back against the wall. And so what? can we put forth in a, kind of a global civic society conversation to maybe bring what we have that's good to the rest of the world and also allow and respect the rest of the world to kind of have their own cultures and their own tribal systems without exporting um, you know, our, our philosophies on them and offending them in a way that then also creates marginalized communities? Give one example of something I, I think has been terrific to do, just what you're talking about. Uh, Kiva.org is, is a microfinance operation on the web that pairs people who are willing to give loans with developing world entrepreneurs. And I've made it a point in the last few years to make 30 or 40 loans to developing uh, world entrepreneurs, particularly women. In, um, in Islamic countries because I feel like that bridge is one of the, you know, obviously there's the most tension there. And what I, what I like about that is, is, is people are coming forward with their, their own initiative, their own entrepreneurism, and that they, that they are looking to have support in. And so it's like we're not imposing something on them, but we are lending money, which ultimately it, it isn't a gift, it isn't a handout, they're expected to pay it back and most do. Um, and and that, that actually, in, in each of those kind of ripples out to touch other people. So I was looking at the stats on Palestine for instance and I think there were something, um, it was, I think the, the stats were about uh, basically like one out of 300 or 500 people in Palestine had received a loan from Kiva.org. 
So if you figured like each one of those people who had received a, a Kiva loan, mostly funded by folks from the West, then has a circle of 150 or 200 people that they've they've had a there, there's a positive ripple effect. Oh, there's been some some generous, not even a hand up, but just like a partnership to help them develop their own uh, self-sufficiency. I think if that kind of a thing scales up to a global level, it, it, it really, um, you know, it, it, we, we, can, we, can, it, we can make a much, much smaller investment ahead of the curve and avoid these massive investments of military down the road. Uh, let me go back to what you said uh, uh, about the Marshall Plan, Pedram. Uh, the Marshall Plan is a blue-orange plan. We need a purple-red plan uh, because uh, the, uh, the Arab Spring turned into Arab Winter, and um, uh, it, the, Arab, uh, the Arabs, most of the Arabs, are centered in, in the feudal system. Uh, uh, and they're trying to, to in Egypt, they're trying to create uh, some semblance of democracy. Uh, they succeeded in Tunisia. The quartet uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And now uh, al-Sisi in Egypt is trying to create uh, some institutions uh, uh, with, with he, he needs to get rid of corruption. Uh, Egypt is very corrupt. Um, in in Lebanon, is uh, uh, Hezbollah uh, held uh, held hostage Lebanon. Uh, in um, in in Palestine, the West Bank is ruled by uh, by Hamas. Um, um, yeah, we need a purple red plan uh, instead of the Marshall Plan. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what purple red means. Is, is that? Can you elaborate uh, it's, on what it's, the colors? It's, it's tribal and feudal. So, and we we there are no nations in in the Arab world. El uh, no. Sisi is trying to create the institutions that can create a nation. Mm -hmm. uh, in in Lebanon, there are, there are no nations. Uh, in Kuwait and the GCC, no nations. No. It's so, the so <coughs> what would this be like? A, a purple? Um, how would? What's an example of that type of approach rather than a Marshall Plan? Uh, I think we need to. Um, I have the Arab Memo project. Uh, it's a. It's an ambitious project uh, that uh, uh, it, it's. It's talking about the educational system, about the religious system, uh, about the law enforcement system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so uh, yeah. Well, Pedro, I'm just going to jump in. I'm I'm listening to you, Elsa, as a as a listener on this call. And what I just like to to say to our listeners is is the colors that are being referenced. These are all yeah. elements. Um, uh, of spiral dynamics. And it's it a, a developmental model. Yeah, developmental model, very powerful. It's been used successfully in um, uh, South Africa with apartheid and uh, certainly in Israel and, and or the Palestinian uh, uh, areas as well. And, and so that's that's what, uh, what what these colors are referencing. I just wanted to say that as well. Okay, all right, real, thank you. Real quick, uh, th and to, to that point, Greg, there was a process that happened um, after apartheid after apartheid in South Africa where there was a reconciliation process, and they really sat down and, and went through grievances and talked it through, and to, to a certain extent, you know, many people say that was a very successful model for uh, addressing some of the grievances and, and healing the wounds that, that had uh, impacted that nation. Uh, is there something we need need in the aftermath of imperialism uh, to kind of make things right. I mean, look, the, the British and the French went in there and cut up the Middle East. Exactly. They, took, they, tried to, they tried to put a nation-state sure. narrative on a <laughs> tribal society, and um, that's not, that, that hasn't really worked out well, right? And so um, the, the question would be, what, you know, do, do, does the West owe the Middle East an apology? Uh, you know, what, what do we got to do to open up a dialogue to say, how can we fix this? Actually, colonialism helped the Middle East. Uh, 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 it, it, they built schools. Uh, they built the American University. The, ev the ev evangelical built the American University. And it was the best university in the whole Middle East. Uh, um, 
um, uh, they, they build schools. Um, uh, Jesuits uh, build my school. Uh, uh, hospitals, etc. Um, <coughs> colonialism was good for the Middle East. Mm. Well, that's a, that's, so, a, a, that's a strong statement. I, I think it's an interesting piece. I, I, I would say that you know it's like everything comes with its benefits and its shadows. And I think that there's, I think that trying to conclude good or bad is probably <coughs> not ultimately going to be as constructive as say there was a good aspects and bad aspects and that to the extent that we we can really own and take responsibility for some of the bad aspects I think that's a sign of greater maturity as a country um, that that like for instance with the whole ISIS situation to really own the degree to which the destabilization of Iraq and then the funding of of rebel groups and their arms a lot of those arms were redirected to ISIS and and so the refugees that are streaming out of uh, out of Syria we as a country we have a direct per, direct responsibility in the creation of that scenario and then if we want to wash our hands of it and make it Europe's problem I think that's a real abdication of leadership. And so, yes, there are absolutely positives in the Middle East, and there's some real dark shadow sides. And that's where, as a country in America, we tend to fall down. We have a t harder time owning the shadow side of our interventions and the destructive, and and then working with that, because then then at least balances things out. There's the generosity, the building on the one hand, and then their acknowledgement of of uh, mistakes and errors that really end up creating a lot of suffering, and that we need to take responsibility for helping to be a solution for some of the some of the suffering that emerges. Now, I'm going to follow on with what what Stephen's saying here. I uh, you'd asked me earlier, and and um, you know if if we think of the the balance of power throughout the world, uh, Iraq was definitely what we would call a keystone. And when we took that keystone out, when we destroyed the infrastructure in Iraq and didn't put anything in place of it. Uh, you know, that is the, the pivot point for much of, of what we're seeing today. Um, I, I'm thinking in terms of, of both short-term and, and long-term solutions, and I think some of the things we're, we're talking about here are, are really good in terms of long-term and futuristic solutions. But right now, <clears throat> in, in the, the immediate need, I, I don't think any of those things can happen unless there's a safe environment uh, mm -hmm. for those things to begin, and that is where I think We've got to be truthful, honest, factual with ourselves uh, about where we are, what we're facing, uh, and in order to avoid uh, a war of a greater magnitude, I think the, the principle of containment and, and really wise use of military action for containment to give us the safe places to go in and demonstrate precisely the things that we're talking about. But before people can can embrace these grander ideas. They've got to feel safe. They have to have a home. They have to have some kind of, of food security, some kind of uh, security for their families. And, and that doesn't exist in many of these places right now. And I think we have to accept our role in that responsibility. And I think, Pedram, to answer your question, by demonstrating our willingness to do that, that would be a huge step for people to begin to see America and the American military in a very different light rather than simply seeing it as a destructive force. Um, amen. So just, just amen uh, to that. And uh, I want to jump in real quickly, guys, um, and introduce uh, a friend that just jumped in. Um, so there's also another perspective, uh, and there's a great, a good percentage of Americans that doubt the, uh, the kind of narrative that was put on us with 9-11 and, uh, you know, all the happenings that kind of drove us into this kind of imperialism to begin with. And so uh, a voice that just that just tagged in is Joe Martino, who's the founder of CollectiveEvolution.com. Joe, welcome. Welcome, buddy. Um, and uh, Joe's Joe represents a different uh, generation of the millennials who basically are like, what what is this? What 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 is this? This doesn't represent me. Why you know I don't necessarily I don't want to be bombing Iraq. Why are we there in the first place? So Joe, just give us a quick intro on on who you are and and then the perspective that you bring there, um, because. It's it's gray, you know. Every the world, everyone, the media tries to make it black and white, and uh, you know, it's just it's a pretty gray world right now, and there's a lot to talk about. Uh, sorry, Joe, we can't hear you. You're muted. Nope. Try it again. Nope. 
All right, Joe's going to Joe's going to test his microphone. As soon as he's back, he'll jump in. Uh, and we'll, it's, we'll it's of course it. our high high tech millennial who can't get the, the <laughs> totally. <sound> Joe, <laughs> Barbara, Barbara's got it going, man. <laughs> well, that's right. well, I, I have help. <laughs> I have big help right here for me to stay on. <laughs> okay, we'll wait. Uh, we'll wait for Joe to, to to get the the mic going, and he'll jump back in. Barbara, uh, perfect timing. You want to you want to weigh in on? Well, that? you know, it just right occurred here. to me about the millennial and how we're looking to them to have some different attitudes. I wonder in the rest of the world what that generation is like. I mean, mm -hmm. I have not even thought about millennials in those other countries. And are they in the blue-purple? Or are they coming up to the orange? Or have they jumped into uh, the new? And it's a really good question, um, for Elsa to say, are we, I mean, and I'll broaden it just a little bit, not just millennials, but people everywhere whose life impulse is creative and uh, loving real, and real they, quickly, they exist everywhere. Yeah, real quickly, before you do that, um, can Elsa, can you qualify with these colors? Because Don, Don couldn't make it onto the call, but I just want to okay. make sure that the, the, the so, hundreds of viewers that are on here know what, what okay. we're talking about here. Okay. So, um, it's a develop, uh, spiral dynamics is a, is a developmental model. Um, it says life conditions activate certain capacities in the brain. So, life conditions of the cavemen and women activated certain capacities in the brain. Now, we became clan and eventually we became tribes. So, we need uh, uh, more capacities in the brain. Then uh, uh, Attila the Hun or Attila the Hen uh, moved from uh, the tribe. <laughs> she, uh, they, they didn't want to listen to the elders of the tribe, so they created feudal lords. And from feudal lords, uh, we created nations. Nations that have institutions are essential for uh, for the emergence of yellow second tier and uh, we have the so-called American dream the enterprising system with the 2.3 kids and uh, the boat the uh, the the apartment etc and there's a green system uh, where uh, uh, in, in egalitarian value, it's like the social democracy in uh, in Germany. And then there's the second tier system. It's flex flow. Uh, it yellow is uh, systemic. Um, uh, uh, yellow is um, uh, looks at different systems in this uh, at the same time. So, so yellow is... looks at the big picture as well. Okay, and so in, in the context of the narrative here is that we're talking about societies that are in different colors along in, in, inside of this type of architecture, and we're trying to juxtapose, um, say, like liberal democracy on a tribal system. Uh, they're just, they're not able to receive that's that, it. and that's creating conflict? That's it, that's it. Mm -hmm. So uh, Iraq is now divided into three sections. Uh, Kurdistan is semi-independent, uh, Baghdad where the Sunnis are and uh, uh, is uh, almost independent and the Shia in the, uh, in the south, uh, uh, they're, they're semi-independent as well. So uh, Joe Biden was right when he said Iran, uh, Iraq is going to divide it in three sections. Yeah, and and so the, then here's here's another question, and I I'm not sure what the answer to this is, and I'd love to hear you guys' opinion on this. Is what's wrong with that, right? Why are we so insistent on throwing disparate groups into an artificial construct of a nation state, and and trying to impose some sort of narrative on them instead of just being like, fine, just do your thing and stop, you know, stop hating each other. It's cool. I, I, I'm not sure that us trying to make a unified Iraq is is for us or for them. I think because we killed Saddam and Saddam was keeping Al Qaeda out of uh, uh, Iraq. And we killed Al Qaddafi. He's he's keeping Al Qaeda out of uh, Libya as well. So we killed the two um, symbol of uh, uh, of the feudal lords. Yeah. 
Well, those are the keystones that we, we were talking. We've taken those keystones out, and as much as we may not like to think in, in those terms, that was the reality that, that we were facing. Uh, Pedram, I want to go back to the conversation uh, that we just touched on uh, about the millennials. Um, mm -hmm. And this whole conversation today stems from a dialogue that many of us had behind the scenes. Our audience, uh, those watching, weren't privy to that. But, but I actually touched on this because I think it's important. For millennials, people born in the late eight, uh, 1980s, early 1990s forward, they have never seen a world uh, like we're seeing right now. They have no point of reference, and they are. They're saying, what's going on? How, you know, how, how do we deal with this? And I think this is where this intergenerational cooperation becomes so powerful. Uh, because what we're seeing now, the world has seen before. We've seen it in cycles. Uh, of the past 3,000 years ago. We saw it in the mid-20th century. And it's something that we cannot deal with through the kind of thinking uh, that assumes that the, the, those perpetrating these acts, these atrocities, that they are rational or that they want the same things that we want. So there, we can't find that common ground. And I think this is where some of the millennials, uh, you know, they're asking, what is this all about and what can we do? And they're bringing their insights to the table. And this is where I think we can marry these, these two ways of thinking into an evolutionary response. It's more than what we've had in the past. I love it. I love it. That's actually perfect because we got Joe back with audio. And Joe has this enormous online platform that has a tremendous amount of sentiment um, that is, you know, kind of corralling that. Um, and that's exactly it. It's like, what? I, I didn't start this. Like, I didn't go into Beirut in the first place. And now it's my problem and I'm getting blamed for it. So there's, you know, a lot of people are being born into a world uh, with problems that our forefathers created. So, Joe, uh, say hi to the group and to the audience and uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's uh, uh, interesting to be here because it's interesting to have these conversations, um, especially since this morning uh, we actually had uh, a team meeting. Um, we were discussing sort of um, the future of our platform and, and what we wanted to bring in terms of, per of a perspective when it comes to news um, because I believe when you look at it, you know, you have mainstream media, you have alternative media, and each does their bit. Uh, to inform, but you know, as we know from uh, you know various whistleblowers uh, following the money, whatever, however you want it to go through it, um, we do know that a lot of media is, is often biased, either in a political sense or in a, a corporate sense. And so, getting a clear picture and finding clarity is incredibly difficult. And so, even as people who are in tune every day, looking, finding the sources, having interviews with high-level people, and doing this stuff, we're like wow, like, this is a confusing world to navigate yourself. And, and, it, and it goes back to the saying, it's like you could search but never find the truth. And the, the challenging aspect of that is I believe that at times, as beings, we like to get super nitty gritty with the logical details. When in reality, there's an importance in just understanding how we feel about an issue. When we look at the, the Paris attacks and we look at what's happening, there's a whole level of, what is happening? How does this make us feel? What is going on within us when we see this stuff? We know terrorism is not good. We know that seeing people die is not good, but ultimately, what can we learn from this experience from a deeper level of understanding than simply it's time we attack back, right? And so I think that's part of why this conversation is here is because we know that doing what we've done for a long period of time is not going to work. You know, as a person who, who like Greg was saying, you know, has come into a world and, and I've not really seen a world that doesn't have some level of, of you know, uh, high level conflict or uh, stuff going on that's sort of in our faces all the time. Um, I, I think there's just, there's a level of, of, of new understanding coming from a lot of young people, but also being born, I think, in a lot of, of older people is just this idea of, okay, so how can we do things differently? We're evolving as a species consciously. What can we do to actually look at things in a different light? And so our form of journalism, and what we talked about a lot today, is there's this gap in media. Because we do know that media has a big influence on people. We're not just being informed, but we're being told how to think about an issue. And what we're trying to do is say, okay, if we can it, it, for example, if you look at the past say, eight or nine articles that we focused on on our, on our site, all with regards to the, the Paris issues, uh, looking at terrorism, looking at all this stuff, there's a clear-cut um, 
voice or language that's being used in a lot of ways to really push uh, an understanding of taking a step back and saying, what are we seeing here? What are we learning? How can we strip out sort of the, the, the deep political polarizations that we have? How can we strip out the hate? How can we strip out the blame game? Right? Because that's something that we do like to play is this blame game of whose fault it is. And, and that's, that's why coming in as a, as a younger person, I don't look and say, well, the older generations created this for us. And No, I recognize that I'm part of, uh, I'm a droplet in the ocean of all human beings that are here to play, to learn, to grow. And we need to recognize that and come up with solutions that are humanity-based. Right versus okay, the millennials are just going to have to you know uh, slowly uh, eventually you know knock off uh, the older people as we as the <laughs> generations continue to to get older and we'll never be able to change it unless we wait 50 years. I don't agree with that. I believe we can make transformation incredibly quickly. And in order to do that, though, we got to come back with what unites us all, which is the feelings we have within our hearts, within ourselves. Right? There was an exercise that happened not too long ago here in our office where people sat in a circle. And they all looked at strangers that had literally spent maybe two hours with each other. And somebody went in the center and people were saying nice things to each other, right? Sorry, to that person in the center. It went around in a circle. Now, it seems like a really simple exercise. But for some people who had never had that experience, by the end of that exercise, they literally said, the longer this went on, the greater I felt in being of service to others in seeing the similarity that exists to others. When they initially walked in that room, what went through their minds? The judgment of who's this and who's that, what side are they on? Oh, they're dressed like this, they're this race, they might be this religion. But then an exercise happened that broke mm -hmm. all of that down. And it came down to what connects all humanity, all beings. That person was then inspired to go about their day and their week under a different level of consciousness that allowed them to see other human beings as different. And that's where I think we need to take these exercises to a greater level. Insert this type of thinking into media. Inter insert this type of language, this type of conversation into media so that issues are less about who did this and who did what and how we're going to respond politically and more about how we can unite as humanity, learn what it is that's happening and create a different level of conversation. Now, I know that's not a super easy flip the switch task, but I believe that's where we need to start. Well, well, and that's, and that's like why we're here. Yeah. I'd like Go to ahead, respond Barbara. to that just for a moment because I think that's exactly right. And he, just to add on that, this is something I have felt for so long, and it's just at the threshold of happening, and I'd like to say this that if you look at every sector of society, if you look at health, education, economics, religion, in that sector of endeavor, there are people who are doing exactly what you're saying, who are caring, who are loving, and very creative and innovative in projects and solutions. And we don't see them emerging as the news of who we are. And the greatest simple thing along the lines that you're saying is to make a concerted effort of noticing, connecting, communicating, and inviting anyone anywhere in the world who feels drawn toward that to place themselves in that field. And it can be on the internet, it can be what Teilhard de Chardin called the noosphere. And I just want to tell you all, what I think one of the reasons I am on this is <clears throat> <coughs> Barbara, Barbara, you muted yourself by accident. There it okay. is. Okay. Yeah. Er, well, uh, I'm going to back up just a moment. This has been something I've, I've worked on for many years, and recently, a group called Green Heart, and you were going to be there, Greg. I'm so sorry you couldn't. Invited about 45 groups, including Ions and Pachamama and uh, Buddhist monks and all the most wonderful people who had large-scale organizations to come together on the idea of how do you connect the positive such that we could begin to see the emerging culture that is in our midst and it's probably in our midst in all sectors of society it's not only at the, the, the yellow and the turquoise it's everywhere to some degree and that this group decided to form something called Global Purpose to create a network that anybody could be part of, any group, anywhere. And it's a very early stage of moving forward to connect what's positive. Mm 
So when Urban Laszlo and I were both asked by Charlie Gay to write something about Paris, Urban wrote a long paper mainly on forgiveness and how it's necessary to deal with real problems like climate change which can destroy the entire planet. It's a very erudite and good paper that's going out and then I've been asked to write a second statement following Urban's statement to do sort of what you just said is to invite people to place their innovations, creative solutions, and desire to be loving, <laughs> desire to be creative, up so we can have a new story. It's a daily story. It's happening everywhere. And there's something in the, in the human psyche that we notice what isn't working. And it's very hard for us to concurrently see what's emergent. So I'm putting my energies into working with the teams of people, and would be great to have you on it too, to, to give some insights as to how we can do this all ages, all sizes, all shapes. Because there is, as you say, something that transcends when you get into this big experience of heart <coughs> and creativity. And so uh, I think that's one of the things that can be done. And one last thought here, in, in evolution, crisis precedes transformation. Problems are evolutionary drivers. And I remember, Predram, when I first met you at the Evolutionary Leaders, and I was giving this as my vision of how to connect what's creative, and you said that you knew people in every field of endeavor, that you could fill out that wheel of co-creation in a day. Well, l listen to that. And so I'm now saying, let's do that, along with absolutely everything else, because you can't tell who's going to be attracted by a life-giving force. You can never say that it's because of this or that culture that you won't be attractive. And <clears throat> I can remember when I was doing this in the 70s with black power leaders and white southern bigots and everybody that disagreed with everybody else. When there was something they thought they could create and be part of that was greater, people changed fast. Now that may be idealistic and I've had some arguments with Don Beck <laughs> about whether this is feasible. But anyway, this I want to add this because it's going to happen, and we'd like to make it as useful as possible. Um, can I, uh, real quickly, so we have um, these knee-jerk reactions. The French are doing exactly what we did in 2001 right now, and they're just like, you know, uh, hundreds of sorties and, and, and bomb the hell out of these guys, and we're going to get them back. The Russians just jumped in. They're doing the same thing. And so we have the kind of military knee-jerk reaction that um, is kind of coming from that level of consciousness. My question to the uh, esteemed people here in this Hangout is, what can we do right now, our listeners, the people that are on this Hangout, and it's not just us, it's about everyone who's here, right? What can we do? Who can we reach out to? What kind of evolutionary path can we put forth right now to start healing this with the people in the Middle East and all marginalized countries? Forget about just the Middle East. I mean, Africa, there's problems everywhere. How can we start to change this perspective and create another path, another circuit, other than the knee-jerk bomb them out of uh, bomb them into submission uh, mentality that is dominating the airwaves? Because we know where that leads. Um, I just did an interview with the Green Beret who said we were absolutely wrong in doing that. It messed everything up. We shouldn't do that again. And that's what France and Russia are doing. So let's let's talk about solutions that each of us can take every single day that might be able to bridge that gap and and, and kind of fill in some of those conversations and heal. And and I'll throw that to anyone who wants to jump in. To me, uh, the value system perspective uh, uh, on terrorism is between a closed system and a closed system. Uh, what, what, do I, uh, what do I mean uh, by that? Um, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the feudal lord are our closed system, and the green system in 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 uh, in, uh, in Paris is uh, is a closed system so it's a clash between civilizations uh, um, um, uh, when a manager sees a Muslim sounding uh, 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 person they uh, he he toss it in in the trash not all Muslim are, uh, Muslims are uh, are alike. There's a value system perspective. I have friends who are definitely orange, millennials who are definitely orange. Uh, I have friends who are uh, uh, they they try to be uh, yellow. Uh, 
so uh, 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 it it I find it hard to accept that in Paris attacks uh, uh, attacks Belgium did not take responsibility for their own problems. Well, so. So, yeah, I, I was going to kind of build, circle back to what you were asking more about the practical actions. I, I think that, yeah. well, I mean, if we're really looking, like, we can't at this point stop Russia or France from bombing. And so we have to think about, okay, what we can do on the soft side or the reconnective side or reconnecting with the human family. I think what Barbara's saying is great. Long-term investment in positive culture building is definitely, that's the longer term. But the shorter term, it's like somehow we have to bridge these worlds, the kind of new paradigm emergent culture, and we've got the more reactive uh, mainstream culture. And then there needs to be this kind of bridge zone where we are looking for those high leverage points that we can create um, different initiatives. So, for instance, I, we were just talking with the head of Search for Common Ground in D.C. They have this whole program called Solia, which is built, it's specifically, it's like virtual exchanges across the uh, Western Islamic divide, so at a university level. So that's an interesting program to be get involved in. We, we were thinking about peace friendships, so it's like making a commitment individually to build a, build a, a connection or relationship across a divide so that we're sort of starting to build that process. Um, another, another thing that I think is really important that that the our our senators and representatives we met with them last week or their their senior staffers they track every day the phone calls and emails in to those offices um, Feinstein's senior legislative aide said listen it's like we need your help on having more calls pro refugees right now because every day we're getting more anti things and this was before Paris happened so now we have all the governors withdrawing and, and, and legislation in the Senate that is disastrous to like you know essentially punish the Syrian refugees who are trying to flee this situation and are so heavily vetted like we should be going from 10,000 Syrian refugees to 100,000 refugees like um, but with the same level of rigor of vetting and so instead of like shutting ourselves down it's like we're we're voicing to our senators and representatives we're building across the divide ourselves we're making micro loans to to developing entrepreneurs we might do social media things where we're like you know we love we love you is uh, we love islam you know to counterbalance this reactionary polarizing destructive energy which which we can't fully stop at this point but we need to counterbalance yeah, I agree, Stephen. I'm I'm going to follow on what what you're saying. I, I um, <clears throat> you know, we are part of a, a living system, and I think living systems uh, provide a beautiful model for uh, just about anything that we're dealing with in life. And when when a disease threatens a living system, what that system will do in biology is it will isolate that system so it no longer threatens the rest of of, of the being. Uh, and, and I think that is a, a beautiful model, is, isolating. Uh, the, the, the very acts that threaten our existence. And, and I want to go back to, um, to Joe. I want to go back to what he was saying about the journalism um, because I think this is one of the places that I, I, probably the greatest crisis we're facing right now is a crisis in thinking. And part of that thinking comes from what's called normalcy bias. Normalcy bias is where there's a reluctance to embrace the magnitude of what we're facing. Um, we see evidence of this uh, certainly in the Second World War. Uh, the normalcy bias led to a lot of what was happening in, uh, in Germany during World War II. So I think <clears throat> to be honest, truthful, and factual about what it is that, that we're up against, I think that may be the biggest hurdle we have because there's a lot of media and a reluctance in mainstream media to even acknowledge that these are not isolated, uh, it's not a one-off deal. It's not like Paris happened and it's over. We've been told that we're in a war. We just didn't believe it. And we're reluctant to embrace that fact and the, the fact that we are the targets. So I think the isolationism uh, is the way to avoid the war uh, and to protect our global family in places like Syria. And if we do that well, we may not have the refugee crisis that we're trying to deal with now because when the threat's isolated, those people still have a home. And from that, we go in and do all of these other things. And we can lobby our legislators uh, and our, our representatives to work on our behalf in doing precisely these kinds of things. And they're willing to listen. Uh, we work, I've worked with them in the past here in the state of New Mexico. And they've been willing to listen on, on other, uh, other topics. So I, I think it's, it is, number one, to embrace uh, 
truthfully, honestly, and factually, not about fear and not about warmongering, but there is a, a threat uh, that we're late in acknowledging. We're late coming to the table to acknowledge this. And because of where it is now, we must deal with it in the, the way that it exists today. And in the without going into an all-out war, I think the uh, isolationism is, is, and we know how to do that very well. And once that makes a safe place for us to do all these other things, these beautiful things we're talking about, we can't do that uh, if it isn't safe to go in and, and build the schools and uh, build the hospitals and, and create these cultural bridges. You can't do that uh, when your village is being attacked and, and people have no food. So I'm, I'm looking at, at the short term, this is what I think we can do immediately that, that paves the way for all these beautiful long-term solutions that I'm totally in agreement with and really excited about uh, uh, sharing with uh, our YAL group and others. So uh, I think that's kind of where we are right now, Pedro. You, you know what, I think, uh, Greg, if you just put this all together as to what to do, we've got the three elements. First, immediate, yes. and protection and containment. And second, what Stephen is talking about, interim, very good, doable actions. And they probably exist in every field if you just looked for them and you could see here's what people can do that are immediate. Then if you did the, the suggestion I have is a kind of overall continual identification connection and synergizing what's already creative to empower it further. Not only communicate it but connect it because nature takes jumps through greater connectivity. Those three things are a program. And yeah. it would be nice to say this is a Absolutely. program that came nice out synthesis. of this hangout. Pardon me? Yeah. This is a nice synth synthesis, Barbara. Very nice. It, it, and, and it's actually very creative and uh, I might say rational. <laughs> <laughs> it could also be very effective uh, because you could come in on different levels of it wherever you're capable of coming in. And I'll just add one last point, which is where there is no vision, people perish. There's almost no vision in modern culture well, of that, any kind that's, that's very interesting to anyone. And it does turn out that ISIS has a vision that at least attracts a small group of them. So I would like to add to what I said with the three containers is a continual cultivation of the extraordinary vision of the possible. I'm not speaking of something extraordinary. But we've already got all these capacities including the high-tech geniuses of humanity. And I would like to see the high-tech geniuses brought into this dialogue. Because, Barbara, yeah, oh, sorry. Go, that's, oh, that's just what I'm recommending. Guys, I, we're actually uh, two minutes away from, from uh, end time on this, and okay. I just, I just want to kind of corral it in, because this is a conversation that could go on for weeks, and I think it should. Right. This is a conversation that should birth hundreds of conversations uh, around dinner tables around the country uh, and start your own conversations and keep going. So um, I'd like to say that um, this is, should just be the beginning of us dialoguing and everyone in the West dialoguing with people in the Middle East and there's no more West and East and all this. Let's just cut all that and just have a human conversation about right. a possibility. I love uh, what you're talking about there, Barbara, just to kind of cherry on top is we need a narrative. ISIL yeah. has a narrative and it sucks, yes. but exactly. because we don't have a narrative, at least they have one, and that's not that's not working, right? So working together for a collective narrative that, that is peaceful and, and prosperous and inspiring and, and loving, that seems to be a really good uh, place to end on this, and I'd like to invite everyone uh, in the, the chat room to keep going and keep hanging out and keep having dialogue about this, and then we'll um, I'll, I'll meet with the evolutionary leader um, group and see if we can kind of kind of continue doing more of these and having uh, different guests and, and, and bringing uh, more of these conversations to bear. But let us know in the chat room uh, what you thought of this, what your opinions are, and then we will read them and we'll, we'll also respond as a community. Um, and it's not just the people on the show here. Everyone on, in the chat room is part of this community. It's a global community and, and you know, we'd love to hear from you as well. So uh, I want to thank um, everyone here. Uh, for participating and, and weighing in. I know it's hard with this many people to get a lot of words in in an hour, but I think everyone um, 
uh, shared their light, and um, let's uh, let's keep this going forward. And um, we'll take uh, and, and all the resources that y'all mentioned. Uh, I'd love to just get them emailed, and then we'll put them in a resource in a blog post or something, so people can go find these organizations and just get busy, um, you know, doing doing good deeds and helping the world. So thank you all. We're out of time. Thank you everyone who joined us, and um, uh, hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you so thank much. You so thank you so much. We'll talk awesome soon. work. Bye everybody. Thanks all. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Uh-huh. Thank you.